This is 2LO calling. This is Jack Payne speaking. My boys are going to play to you now a tune by which my band is known all over the world. Are you ready, boys? Yes, Jack. All right, let's go. golden age of British dance bands from 2LO Savoy Hill to Broadcasting House Portland Place. From crystal sets and earphones to high fidelity and stereo. 50 years of changing sounds and changing styles. And how appropriate that we should be saying it with music, the signature tune of the BBC Dance Orchestra when it was directed by Jack Payne. He was not the first resident conductor, Sidney Furman preceded him. But Jack Payne, after his appointment in 1928, made the orchestra and himself national favourites. Well, I was a fan of his from the age of eight. Brian Rust, well-known musical historian and author of a very recently published book called The Dance Bands. And I used to write down everything he played on his uh, tea time broadcast every day and I'd no, no more think of missing one of those and I'd miss the meal itself. In fact, I very often did miss the meal itself uh, because I wanted to listen to what he was playing. Oh, there were hundreds of them. He played just about everything from light classics like Ravel's Bolero to uh, Things like uh, Sing Holly, Go Whistle, Hey Hey, and uh, Sitting on a Five-Barred Gate. And of course there were things like um, all the popular dance tunes, sentimental numbers, and the cheer-up numbers of the Depression period. There's Happy Days Are Here Again as one of them. himself the singer, but the BBC Dance Orchestra sported other vocal talents at that time. Many will remember with affection Irish singer Billy Scott Coomber. We asked him what it was like to broadcast from 2LO. Even before 2LO, it was a miracle. I was walking down O'Connell Street in Dublin when a man said to me, uh, I just won the John McCormick Shield and the Dennis O'Sullivan Cup for singing at the Fesh Show, our big singing festival. And uh, he said, hello, Billy said, uh, how would you like to broadcast? Well, honest, it was like saying, hey, how would you like to meet God? He's a nice fellow, and I'm sure he'd give you a cup of coffee. It was as mi a big a miracle as that. I went and I did my first broadcast. I came over to Savoy Hill. Of course, it was like walking from a tiny little village store into a mammoth big store in the West End of London to go into Savoy Hill in those days. First of all, in the morning, I used to get in roughly about 10 o'clock, and Ray Noble would deliver a couple of arrangements, and we'd rehearse. Jack would come into the studio uh, at approximately 11, 11.15. 11 he would hear what we'd done, give his opinion, and then we'd get down to sectional rehearsals and things like that to one o'clock. We'd start to uh, rehearse again at two, and we would break at somewhere about uh, four o'clock. But we would do the 5.15 till six o'clock broadcast. The fan mail was incredible. It was nothing to get all oh, 15 or 20,000 letters. It was nothing to have the telephone jammed. Oh, that song is going to be a big hit. I'm so in 
love with Mary. I'm born to tears with Rose. Rose is the one who loves me. Ain't that the way it goes? I dance my best with Mary. I step on Rose's toes. Rose says I dance divinely. Ain't that the way it goes? What a fix, oh gee, I'm in an awful tight one. Poor unlucky me, I'm in wrong with the right one. I get the air from Mary. I get the turned up nose, and still I care for Mary, ain't that the way it goes? of the BBC Dance Orchestra with Billy Scott Coomber were many other famous names. Pianist and arranger Bob Busby, who was soon joined by a second pianist, Billy Thorburn. Violinists Eric Sidde, Reg Leopold. In March 1931, trumpeter Jack Jackson joined the band. He'd been playing with Hilton, but Jack Payne spirited him away. And not only him, Poggy as well, E.O. Pogson, a master of just about every musical instrument ever made. He came into the orchestra as lead saxophonist. Uh, funny stuff, Savoy Hill. Now, we couldn't park our cars in those days, just the same as you can't park your car today. Even then, in, in, in 1930, 31, 32, it was pretty grim in London, you see. And underneath the studio windows was the road leading into the back of the Savoy and round Savoy Churchyard. In the Savoy Churchyard were trees, and in the trees, in the evening, the starlings used to come and roost. Now, most of the cars in those days were open tourers, you see. So we used to wait till the street was full of cars and the trees were full of starlings and gradually put the windows up like that and it, till it was all open. At a given signal, all the saxophones and brass would go <laughs> like that, you see. <laughs> with the result that an interesting biological action went on with the starlings and boy it's hard to get off the car when it sets and so we used to <laughs> we used to get a space to park in that, that way the beautiful stuff <laughs> in those two hello days the announcers uh, used to have to wear evening dress and that included you of course john snag Oh, indeed, yes. We always had one in evening dress. It started with the, what was, the 6.15 news, and from then on, we were in evening dress. And there were several reasons for it. I think, in the first place, it went back to the days when the announcer always had to go to the Savoy Hotel for the late-night dance music of Savoy Ophir and Savoy Abana Band. We had to go to the hotel, so we had to be dressed up for that. But then, I think, Reith laid it down, because he felt it was a courtesy to the people who came. Uh, that is to say, dinner jackets were very much in vogue at the time, and speakers used to arrive wearing dinner jackets, and a lot of bands used to wear dinner jackets and so on. And it was felt that the BBC announcer was, in fact, the host as well as the announcer. You didn't, uh, in fact, get to announce Jack Payne, did you? I used to announce the program of Jack Payne. That's, you would introduce the program and introduce Jack Payne. But you see, Jack was the first one who was, in fact, permitted to announce his own uh, program. Now we're going to play a song, something about an argument. You mean the argument fight. song, Jack? What, are you here again? Yes, I am, I am. You're always arguing. Go on, I'll start the whole orchestra. Start the whole orchestra. Go All on. Right, boys, you ready? Jack had a tremendous enthusiasm for this particular job of broadcasting. He was a pioneer, I think, very largely in the whole of the dance band, broadcasting dance band world. He always had novel ideas, novel approaches, and very light-hearted ones. Don't be alarmed, that's only my brother. Oh, this is what I hear when I'm in bed. 
a bang, a rattle like thunder overhead. Then cat, meow, and dog, bow wow. The only sleep I'll get is when I'm dead. A shot goes crack, a gale starts blowing, a duck goes quack. A cock starts crowing, so you may think I'm kidding you. Yet what I say is true, just listen, I'll explain to you. My brother makes the noise that for the talkies. There's not a single noise that he can't do. If you've forgotten what a parrot squawk is, our bill can illustrate that squawk for you. He does the steam escaping from liners leaving dock. He'll take a razor scraping or else a cuckoo clock. My brother makes the noise that's for the talking. There's not a single noise that he can't do. Now then, everybody on the set, we've got to get this picture finished. Are you all ready with the noises? Okay, Chief. Well, silence, everybody. Say, what's the big idea? What the heck are you doing? Okay, camera, shoot. What's the big idea? Well, you said shoot. Say, are you trying to get fresh? Okay, camera, shoot. Murgatroyd, what is the time? Two o'clock. Then we haven't a moment to lose. If we can't get the money by Thursday, there is only one thing for it. We must get it by Friday. Look, you. Leave it to me, Jasper. My car is at the door. I can be in Southampton in no time. By Jove, that was quick. Good morning, Skipper. Sea's a bit choppy. Aye, aye, sir. Now then, all aboard. Up with the gangway. Full steam ahead. By Jove, it's good to be back in China again. Ah, Signor Mugathroy, I believe you come up with a man. Yes? Well, here for you a few notes. Hmm, thank you. I must be going now. Is my aeroplane ready? Ah, there it is. Well, goodbye. 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 Hello, Jasper. London hasn't changed a bit. Have you got the money? Yes, here it is. Good. Three million pounds. At last I can pay the mortgage off the old farmstead. All right, that's okay. Cut. And save your life. He makes the horses neigh, he makes the donkeys bray, he makes the chickens lay at night as well as day. My brother makes the noises for the talkies. Jack Payne's varied involvement in his broadcasts as straight singer, comedy actor, and as announcer had a noticeable result on the air, as Billy Scott Coomber remembers. Frequently, uh, myself or Ray Noble or Bob Busby or somebody would conduct the actual performances, and Jack would rush out, listen to it, and come back again and announce the next item. And it, he used, because he rushed, he used to come up to the microphone and say, well, that was, uh, say it with music now, Here's a little novelty number called, uh, Why Do All the Worms Fly in Sicily, or whatever it was. And the public sent him in hundreds and hundreds of cures for asthma. There was nothing wrong with him. It was just rushing from the little studio where he would insist on listening to the band, and then rushing in and making a breathless announcement. Lady of Spain. There's a little story of how Jack Payne came to record this in mid-1931. It's recalled by his secretary of later years, Yvonne Matz. Toljard Evans wrote that. Uh, Toljard Evans used to play piano in a Paddington dance salon. Billy Cotton was drummer there at the, at the time. Maybe Toljard sc scored a great success with Barcelona and several other compositions. Uh, but he, he couldn't persuade anybody to take, to take an interest in Lady of Spain, except Jack. Jack saw a hit in this latest composition with its Pasadoble rhythm. And Jack had exclusive playing rights for six weeks, and during that time it became an enormous hit, and of course it still played often. Feeling. Why should my lips be concealing? 
Payne as conductor of the BBC Dance Orchestra, made his last broadcast on March the 11th, 1932. But there had been rumours circulating for some while that he wanted to explore wider horizons. His stage shows had been very successful. He'd had a command performance at the London Palladium. And 40 years on, in 1972, Bill Scott Coomber looks back at those four years at Savoy Hill. There was a discipline, of course, uh, by both exerted by engineers and by Sir John Reith. I mean, quite frankly, I think Sergeant Major Britain uh, is an amateur compared to Sir John Reith when it comes to discipline. He was a wonderful man. Uh, it was never a surprise to walk into the studio to find that a new edict had come out and that some work had been banned. Gosh, I, I often wonder why Abide With Me got away with it. It's a wonder that somebody didn't find a fault in that one. <laughs> Although he was not actually interested in dance music as such, but he was very, very much in love with a young, very young lady called Miss BBC. Anyway, in 1932, Jack Payne left the BBC to uh, concentrate on this, this stage band show. And it was great success again. Management's clamoured for him. Uh, Jack Hilton was doing a similar sort of thing. In fact, Jack Payne and Jack Hilton were out stunting each other. If, if one had a, a cage lion worked into a production number, then the other one had maybe an elephant. Incidentally, we never used a note of music. Every note was memorized by these 20 odd musicians of mine. But we had to put on productions to interest the people, apart from what was happening to the music. Um, something had to happen too to keep their interest. Scenic effects. Of course, you know, in those days we had all got all kinds of things. For example, in Choo Choo, Jack Payne's band had a fully, a full locomotive that used to burst through a back cloth in the back and we'd finish up halfway into the audience with the band all sitting on the top of a full-size Flying Scotchman type locomotive. Almost immediately after leaving the BBC, the same musicians, now billed simply as Jack Payne and his orchestra, embarked on making the film Say It With Music. Ray Noble, who had scored so many of the band's numbers, was engaged to write the music for the picture. I was very busy myself and didn't have time to go down to the studios. So they called me up and they said, well, we want one more song, we want a ballad. 
can you get it by Thursday or something like that? And I said, yes, all right, Thursday. So I wrote Love is the Sweetest Thing and sent it down. There was dead silence for a week. <laughs> and then somebody in the film end of it rang up and said, well, you'll be glad to hear that we recorded that ballad you sent down and it came out all right. <laughs> I said, I'm glad of that. He said, you're a very clever guy. You know, you're very smart. I said, why am I so smart? He said, well, you've stolen God Save the Queen. I well, never thought of that. Well, actually, if you look at the first five notes, they are almost God Save the Queen. Of course, the whole way they are put around is different, and it was quite unconscious on my part, but he thought I had stolen God Save the Queen. <laughs> Early in 1933, two of Jack Payne's star players left the band in what has been described as somewhat mysterious circumstances. They were Jack Jackson and Poggy Poxon. Naturally, we asked Jackson to talk about his days with Jack Payne, but unfortunately at the moment, he's a little indisposed. He apologizes for not being able to talk to us, and we'd like to wish him a return to full health as quickly as possible. However, in his place, we invited his longtime friend, Mark White, head of BBC Radio 2, to recount, as he knows it, the Jackson Poggy episode. This particular story is alleged to have taken place during a band rehearsal when I suppose they would have been trying out new arrangements. Payne, I suppose, was in a particularly bad mood on this particular day, although, according to Jack, it was nearly always somebody's turn in the band to get picked on as the butt of his bad temper if it was a bad day. And on this particular occasion, the butt that he chose was Poggy who of course was a great personal friend of Jack's and it seemed that as the rehearsal went on nothing that Poggy did was right and it all got worse and worse and worse and more and more aggravation in the end Jack felt that he could stand this no longer and that he must do something about it and he stood up in the back row of the brass section 
and yelled at Payne, if you don't lay off him, I'll come and beat you across the head with this trumpet, to which Payne instantly replied, you're fired. Too late, said Jackson, I just quit, come on, Poggy, and they both got up and walked off the bandstand, accompanied by cheering from all the rest of the boys. And needless to say, the uh, incident was subsequently made up, and uh, both Jackson and Payne remained on friendly terms for many years afterwards. He was mercurial, he was brilliant, uh, he would blow his top at the slightest movement of anybody, or, or producers, or anybody, engineers, a lot, he would blow his top, but it was only a temporary moment that passed very quickly, and he'd calm down, and uh, his charm was, uh, I think, considerable. His generosity was unbelievable. <laughs> By a waterfall, one of the tunes the Jack Payne band was playing in the winter of 1933-34, after the departure of Jackson and Pogson, when new faces had appeared in the band. Later on, there was a complete reshuffle, and one of the new violinists was Cyril Stapleton. And that must have been round about 1935-36, somewhere around about there. Mm -hmm. oh, we used to have all sorts of funny things go wrong on the stage in those days. I remember on one occasion we'd made a film, and uh, Jack had had a stage set built it was rather like the set in the film, you know, gigantic rostrums with flights of steps going up and the saxophones were all seated on a rostrum which was about four feet high and painted white and they had to go up steps to get on it. So, <laughs> one of the saxophone players, Arthur Berkeley, had gone down to the front to play his bit by the microphone at the front of the stage and coming back he thought instead of climbing up the steps and getting onto the rostrum, he jumped onto the rostrum, so he leapt up in the air, landed on the rostrum, the, the bottom platform gave way and the whole of the saxophone section disappeared. And all the band could see for the next five minutes were odd heads popping up, you know, the complete band dried up, of course. And Sid Millwood was the, uh, was the leading sax in there, he disappeared down with the rest of them, it was very funny. I can tell you one rather funny story, we were over in our stand and uh, we were going to play Ravel's Bolero. Now this meant about, oh, it took us about 10 or 12 days to memorize this work. And uh, Jack Payne came on the stage, the house was packed, and suddenly we were doing very well, and I just gave him a nudge and I gave him a look. I said, Jack, come here. And I said, do you know who's sitting in the third row? He said, no. I said, Sir Henry Wood. He says, oh my God. Because Sir Henry Wood, this was his favorite piece to close the proms. But we, to make it commercial, had made a cut of about three minutes in this seven or eight minute work. And Sir Henry Wood was sitting in front and I watched his white beard as he was nodding the three, four tempo, conducting it imaginatively. And suddenly we came to the cut. And it was just as if somebody had hit him hard in the chops. He stopped dead in his tracks. And then he smiled and we went on with the work. As a show band that was touring all over Britain and the continent, we wondered how Jack Payne organised the travelling. His secretary, Yvonne Matz, told us... Well, mostly, to start with anyway, they travelled by train, and, and they became well known to every station master of the big stations throughout the country. Uh, I think some thought they were rather mad. And uh, incidentally, travelling by train inspired, you can't do that there here. And, and that became not only a popular song, uh, but a catchphrase too. Thank <laughs> you. 
We're going to sing a nonsense song, no doubt you'll think it's weird. The words are either very new or else have grown a beard. The curate came on Saturday to our annual dinner, but when he took his knitting out, we shouted, Mr. Skinner. Oh, he can't do that there, no, he can't do that there. Anywhere else you can do that there, but you can't do that there. Jimmy Longshot went to see Lord Tommy Tittlemouse. Of course, he was the honored guest and came to shoot the grouse. The fun was fast and furious when someone shouted, Jimmy, you've missed the grouse and gone and shot his lordship in the spinney. Oh, you can't do that there, yeah. no, you can't do that there, yeah. Anywhere else you can do that there, but you can't do that there, yeah, man. Auntie Gertie's 86, she's fit for anything. She got engaged last Wednesday week to dear old Dr. King. The other night, the old man said, I hope I don't intrude, dear. Let's hear a game of tiddlywink. She said, now don't be rude, dear. Oh, you can't do that there, yeah. Oh, you can't do that there, yeah. Anywhere else you can do that there, but you can't do that there, yet. Yeah. I used to be a baritone. On ballads posh I'd sing. But now I moan in monotone. And it don't mean nothing. I nurse the mic so soulfully upon the radio. What a rero, what a rero, what a rero, it did little low. Oh, you can't do that there, no, you can't do that there. Well, anywhere else I can do that there. But you can't do that there, yeah. that area. The Payne Band's triumphant progress through the land was conducted later not by train, but by car, a fleet of Singer Airflows, all with registration numbers in sequence, and all painted in the band's distinctive colors of chocolate brown and cream. A great publicity idea for the cars and the band. Everyone knew when Jack Payne was in town, and they wanted to know. This was a whole variety show in one unit. As such, in the act, were one or two who were not what they appeared to be. Bill Scott Kilmer used to be the guitar player with the rubber strings. And at that time, we used to have five saxes in the band, but only four played. The fifth saxophone player was a man named Phil Trix, who was really an acrobatic dancer, and used to do all the comedy bits in the band. And Phil used to sit there, standing up, lifting it up, playing away like mad sitting down, but he never had a reed in it. So with Bill, <laughs> Bill Scott Kilmer's rubber strings, and Phil Trix had no reed in it, you see, but at the end of the show, towards the end of the show, Phil Trix used to put his uh, saxophone down in his stand and do three or four double backflips across the stage. He's a great acrobat. Off the side of the stage, everybody thought this was marvellous. Wonderful musician, not only played the saxophone, was an acrobatic dancer as well. I don't know if you can hear anything, but there's Phil Trix doing a marvellous dance with a hat and cane. <laughs> of course, it's a regular stage show. On the least like a broadcast from a studio. Footlights, drop scenes, bands dressed in white flannels and brown jackets. Oh, I wish you could see the somersault without touching the ground. <laughs> Christopher Stone describing part of a Jack Payne presentation with Phil Trix, who was later to be replaced by Bernard Delfont and his eccentric dances. Uh, I don't think there was anybody else. Um, Miss Peggy Cochran, of course, who afterwards married Jack, uh, she was a very fine um, pianist, a very excellent classically trained pianist, but rhythmic as well, and um, played violin very well and sang very nicely. And she came with us on tour all for quite a long time. The first time I worked for him was at the Hoban Empire. And uh, this was rather a terrifying experience as he booked me with an agent, you see, and I'd, I'd never played with his band before, but uh, I was featured artist. And um, I was very interested, actually, to watch him because he was a real perfectionist in every way, and he used to conduct Absolutely marvellously, I thought, with a very definite beat, not just the one up and the one down, like some people do, you know. 
But he really loved music, all sorts of music, and he did this, made a marvellous job of it. But I was terrified, because if he couldn't get his own way with his, uh, what he wanted to do, you know, with music, and then he used to get into rather bad tempers, yes. And uh, I never got to know him uh, there, because he was always very aloof. During the war, Jack um, was asked to do a big programme with a, with a big augmented orchestra. And it was called, as the BBC came up with this idea, I think, it was called Favourites of the Famous. And the BBC rode round to very famous people, including Churchill, but of course poor dear Churchill was <laughs> too busy <laughs> to help us. But he got some very, very famous people to send in their favourite, the names of their favourite pieces, I mean classical. And he did these most beautifully. During our conversation with Peggy Cochran, we asked her for any special favourite recording that she recalled making with the Jack Payne Orchestra. Oh, it was a wonderful record, but it's out of print now, and I haven't even a copy. El Andaman Concerto. It's a gorgeous record, and I'm dying to hear it again. enormously varied repertoire the band had. Novelty songs, comedy songs, ballads, and even more serious works. And many were specially written for their radio and stage appearances. Perhaps one of the strangest was Hot Coffee. Uh, Billy Thorburn and I were... It was the first roadhouse in Great Britain. At the Ace of Spades on the Kingston Bypass. We called in there, and we were having a coffee, it was in the morning, and a big heavy lorry pulled in, and uh, it had engine trouble, and the exhaust and uh, I had a cup of hot coffee in front of me and I just turned to Bill Thorpe and I said Bill, there's a song in this hot coffee because coffee was only coming in this country had uh, drunk tea, 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 tea for generations and so we got down to it and we wrote this song called Hot Coffee it was orchestrated by Bob Busby and I've got the only existing copy Jack Payne's band playing hot coffee. Hot coffee, brown sugar, no milk, mm -mm. black coffee. Hot coffee, brown sugar, and if you use hot milk, I'm a sweetheart too. I'd much prefer just to keep a tool. When I'm dining with my sugar, I pretend that I like my hot coffee.
coffee and a pretty hot performance too from the Jack Payne Band, a kind of excitement that made it a nationwide favourite. In the 60s, when Jack Payne was presenting his popular BBC record programmes, I reminisced with him about how advancing radio and recording techniques were contributing to the changing sounds. Well, oh, Alan, it's always fun to reminisce, you know. I suppose I can claim that I was taking an active part in recording um, during the, what's like all the transition stage, you know, when they changed over from horn to electric recording. In the old days, everybody used to crowd round a cluster of horns, similar to the old phonograph horns. And uh, they well, just went on playing as loudly as possible. Uh, but with the arrival of the microphone, things became very much easier. We were then able to achieve a more satisfactory tonal quality and so on. But there was no such thing um, as re-recording just a single section of a number as they do now. It was... Um, well, just a case of all or nothing, you know. <laughs> we couldn't take a pair of scissors, for instance, or a razor blade and splice in a few uh, inches of tape, as they do now, if we made a mistake. Everything was recorded on thick wax masters, and these were then sent to the factory, the processing plant, to uh, be made into matrices. And only after that could one hear the result of one's efforts. But. These days in the recording studio, Jack, the scene and techniques are very different. Oh, indeed. Well, we've now come to a very, very advanced stage in high-fidelity recording. Instead of one, there may be a dozen or more microphones with various characteristics, uh, picking up the sound from the different sections of an orchestra or an individual instrument. And uh, much of the responsibility for the recording rests with the engineer twiddling the, these old knobs, you know? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the artist and recording manager too. Uh, they mainly decide on the quality and any gimmick sounds and they can well, they do what they like with the tape, they edit it and so on, you know, mm -hmm. that thing I was talking about earlier. Um, one advantage, of course, is that the performer can these days hear the recording back within a few seconds and so make corrections right away if necessary. All of which has added to the quality and high fidelity of sound we can now enjoy on records and radio for devoting their time and contributing to these reminiscences of Jack Payne and his music, I should like to thank Peggy Cochran, Yvonne Matz, Billy Scott Coomer, Cyril Stapleton, Poggy Pogson, Ray Noble, Billy Turnant, Mark White, John Snag, Brian Rust, and Jack Payne himself. of British bands was compiled and introduced by Alan Dell and produced by John Knight who acknowledges the help of Chris Ellis of EMI and Jeff Milne of Decker for their assistance in the preparation of this series.